Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Trogly's Guitar Show. I couldn't help myself. As soon as I knew these things existed, I had to check one out. This is the brand new 2019 Gibson The Paul 40th Anniversary Reissue. A The Paul was originally made from 1978 through 1980, then they changed the name to Firebrand, later brought back the Paul's name, but the first runs of these instruments were made of all walnut, and that is what these guitars are bringing back. Now, if you're looking for an in-depth comparison between the reissue to the original, stay tuned. I'm going to post a very thorough video in a few days because I just ordered a 1980 The Paul. So we will go super in-depth in that video. But for this review, I want to just review it as a guitar, not as a reissue of something, as well as capture my first impressions. This is a limited edition release. Gibson has not announced how many they plan on producing. Usually when they do something like this, there is about 400 made though. These instruments have a walnut body and a walnut neck paired with a rosewood fretboard. This particular example is a two piece body, as you can clearly see here on the back and a three piece neck. The claim to fame for this model is all the contouring that it has instead of a carved top. It bevels in right where your arm will rest. That way there's not like a sharp edge digging into you. Same thing with the back. You've got a nice comfort carve right here. That way it rests right up against your body. These also feature a smooth satin finish instead of your traditional gloss. This gives you a closer to raw wood feel, which many players prefer. You have Gibson's 490R and 498T pickups. So think kind of classic rock sounds, but you've got a little bit more bite to the bridge. And you have a traditional Les Paul layout here, except for your three-way toggle switch is right here on the instrument instead of up here. It has a nice 60s rounded neck profile to it. So what that means is it's thin, but not overly thin, and it's nice and rounded. And the headstock is natural. There is no veneer over it, and you have a Golden Gibson logo. Now, I was doing some hunting. I was trying to find one that had spectacular wood grain, and this is the first one that I saw that was like, you know what, this is okay. Because that's the beautiful thing about the original series, the Pauls and walnut wood in general, is it's beautiful. Now, it's a plain kind of beautiful. I mean, you might think this looks like a coffee table, but I just love all these intricate wood grain lines in this example. Now, the top's pretty nice. I mean, you've got a little bit of figuring to the wood as well, but what sold me on this one and was a huge criteria is I wanted more intricate patterns on the back. Because if you go to the Gibson website, their stock photos are of a spectacular example, and I wanted to document something very similar. It's a lot of nice waviness here, and you can see it dances around a little bit as well. So these things might look a little bit plain in photos, but they really come to life in person. And here we'll take a look at the three-piece neck here. And it is sweet that they left the volute here because that's a 70s attribute. It's designed to help protect your headstock. It's not necessarily a traditional thing. If you walk into a store and you've never heard of the originals, you might be confused about this guitar or why people are losing their minds that Gibson reissued it. But they're just a nice playing Les Paul and they sell for $13.99 new which comparing to other new models is a fantastic deal, but you can still pick up an original for much cheaper. So now that we've got the basic specs of this instrument out of the way, let's talk about my first impressions of this as somebody who is a diehard fan of the original run. When I first opened the case, I instantly noticed a weird smell. Generally, the brand new Gibson smell used to be vanilla. And there's a bunch of debate whether it comes from the lacquer or if it comes from the case. But there's like a new odor to these guitars now. I noticed that on my 2018 Billy Joe Jr. where it's not quite as pleasant of a smell anymore. 
It's almost kind of a chemical scent to it. It definitely comes from the finish of the instruments. The next thing I immediately saw is, yes, the rosewood fretboard that's different from the originals, but it was very dry. So that was instantly the first thing I did for this instrument because, well, I wanted to tear it apart and look at its insides too, but I oiled that fretboard to make it look much nicer. I'm surprised Sweetwater doesn't do that. I'm surprised Gibson doesn't do it because it seems every brand new Gibson I've gotten, it's the same issue, a very dry looking fretboard. Look at this beautiful headstock. Now I'm gonna ruin it for you forever. There's actually a really strange little strip of maple and it runs right along the truss rod cavity. It became plain as day as soon as I took the truss rod cover off. But once I put it back on, I can no longer unsee that. That is such an eyesore to me because you have all this beautiful walnut everywhere on this instrument, except for this little area right here by the truss rod channel. Now it's hard to see in dealer stock photos if they all have that little strip. I reached out to Sweetwater to see if the other ones they had in stock had a similar thing. And they had one of the techs call me to explain what it is. He basically just said that's how they lay the truss rod into the neck and then they put a small maple strip over it to cover up the hole. And you normally don't see that because there's typically a black holly veneer over top of it. After conditioning the fretboard, what I was really curious about this instrument was how tall the frets were going to be. Because the originals did not have super tall frets. And these ones don't either. So they've kind of got a low flat thing going on, but with a nice crown to the top. So it is a very familiar feel, especially with this 60s styled neck. Next, I was curious what the pickup cavities would look like. It's nothing too out of the ordinary. The neck pickup cavity reads XSN, which likely means satin natural finish. And TP for the Paul in the bridge. I did notice that Gibson must be using a slightly dull router bit because there's kind of like some splintering of the wood as you can see here in these photos. It's very minimal. I mean, the other areas were nice and smooth, so that's just kind of a nitpick. The bridge and tailpiece held a very interesting secret though. These are lightweight tailpieces and bridges. That's something that used to be an upgrade for historic spec guitars only. They're made by advanced plating. As you can see, the back of the tailpiece will say that, and then the bridge has API, which is the exact same thing. But take a look at the studs for the bridge. Gibson recently started including a multi-tool with all of their instruments that has all the Allen keys on it. So it appears that they're trying to make some use out of that, and instead of just having normal posts for the bridge, you can now adjust them kind of like the metric ones that have the slotted screwdriver. These ones now have an Allen key to make adjustment of the action much easier. That's a really cool feature, especially now that they're giving those multi-tools out. On my example, one of the speed knobs must have got cracked in shipping. You can't really blame Gibson for that. But now for the big question. What kind of electronics are in this thing? Now, as soon as I pulled the pickups, I already knew the devastation was going to be there when I opened it. And this is why I was curious enough to buy one of these, is I wanted to know so bad, did they hand wire the electronics? And unfortunately, they have a darn PCB in here. Now there's nothing wrong with the Gibson boards. I'm just being a traditionalist. If you're reissuing something from the 70s, you shouldn't have that garbage in here. <laughs> you also have the large Gibson strap buttons here. So they kind of act as strap locks in a way, not quite as good, but they will hold on to your strap a little bit better. Feel and playability wise, these are very reminiscent of the originals. They sound great and they play great. The neck pickup has a really nice dark creamy tone to it, and the middle position is nice and chimey. But the bridge position, differing from the original T-tops, is about twice as hot, so it kind of allows you to play some higher gain stuff at the same time. So overall, what are my thoughts of this? It is a very nice recreation of a very cool model. 
It's different enough from an original that I think you can justify owning one of each. Because it is still a fantastic guitar. But we'll go into all the super details in a few days, as well as sound comparisons. So now that we've learned a little bit more about the brand new 2019 The Paul reissue, let's go ahead and hear how this one sounds. how this instrument sounds let's go ahead and review its condition this is a brand new guitar i purchased this one from sweetwater you've got a few light dings just from me playing it and whatnot but nothing too bad again i did oil the fretboard so now it looks much nicer 
The frets, they're in like new condition. You might have some light picking scratches on the top here. And this really shows off that contouring. And it's a nice light walnut color. I mean, it's really impressive in person. You've got your original pickups in here. I guess the one good thing about it being a PCB board is it would be very easy to swap these pickups out for something else if you didn't like them. Back of the headstock, serial number 19002-6991, made in USA. You can see you've got a very small ding right here. And this is kind of from the factory. It's not too evenly sanded, but eh, it's not really noticeable. Back of the neck here, everything's good. I just love the back of this one. You don't have any like buckle worming marks or anything. I try not to wear anything that'll damage guitars like that. However, as we go around the side here, there is a very tiny ding right here. It's small, but it's there. But besides that small ding and the broken original knob that still functions, but that's about it. And I just love the sides of this instrument. Lots of nice wood grain once again. You also have some scratches right here, but this still has that plastic coating on it. So if you take that off, that will likely disappear. Let's take a look at the original case here. This is kind of the new style for Gibson. Notice that they dropped the USA part of Gibson's branding on the cases. So it looks a little bit funny. That'll take some getting used to. I'm not sure why they dropped the USA moniker. Hopefully that doesn't mean bad things, but maybe it's just because these cases are actually made in Canada. So they're like, eh, maybe we should not have USA. But you have your traditional five latches, two, three, four, and a fifth back one. And we now have a red interior. And there's a few things I would like to go over about this case. Generally, Gibson would have very plush cases, and that's still the case for the body here. But notice how there's a lack of padding right here. That's so when the guitar is sitting in here and the larger strap button is sticking out, that prevents it from getting damaged if this instrument is dropped in transit or when you're just moving the case. So that's kind of an interesting feature. Most cases have it, but I noticed it's more pronounced in this version. So once again, you've got about an inch of padding along the edges, but when you move up to this headstock cavity, look, it all goes away. They did not pad the headstock cavity at all. Now you might think, oh, Gibson's cheaping out on us, but that's actually meant to protect your guitar even further. If you have padding as the angled headstock goes down, it's just like touching the bottom of the case. So that is in order to protect the instrument. You'll also notice that they have no padding right here, which is interesting because in the 90s, they would actually add a big block here, which in theory was meant to secure the headstock down, but it actually causes more issues with the headstock, you know, being forced in a bad position. Inside the case here sleeps a bunch of case candy, which includes the Gibson strap, that multi-tool, a bunch of other paperwork. It's quite a bit of nice case candy. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this 40th anniversary, The Paul, feel free to check out the Reverb listing. A link will be in the description or message me at troglisguitarshow.com. Thank you, Troglodytes, for watching, and we will see you on the next episode. Take care.